Hi, I'm Simon Pear, and I'm going to read from The Hunt for the Chinese Phantom by Christoph Giesen, Philipp Grühl, Frederick Obermeier, and Bastian Obermeier. You'll probably remember the latter two, the Obermeier brothers, from their bombshell Panama Papers, and this is their investigation into a man who poses a massive threat to humankind in the 21st century as a merchant of death on a gigantic scale. The German original was published by Kiepenhoi and Witsch on May the 4th this year. Chapter 1. Wanted by the FBI. Carl Lee stares straight at the camera. His head with its broad lower jaw is tilted back slightly and his eyes show no emotion. Or is that just the flicker of a smile? The poor picture quality makes it hard to tell. Locks of thick black hair dangle over his forehead, brushing his dark eyebrows. His lips are full, the right eyelid droops slightly, and under his right nostril he has a small wall, mole which the FBI investigators have branded a special feature. They have also noted that he's said to be 5 feet 7 inches tall and weighs about 150 pounds. Brown eyes, male, Asian, a Chinese national. The most striking thing about the picture are the bold red capital letters above the photo announcing that he is wanted by the FBI. The investigators have put out a call for Carl Lee's arrest on their legendary most wanted list where his name features alongside those of serial killers, sexual abusers and human traffickers, major swindlers, foreign spies and terrorists. Compared to him though, the others are small fry, because the bounty on head, his head is the highest on the register. Anyone providing significant information leading to his arrest can pocket a $5 million reward. Someone on whose head the FBI has set such an enormous bounty is what the Americans commonly refer to as an enemy of the state. $5 million makes you a major league criminal. Yet Carl Lee is neither a drug baron nor the commander of a terrorist group. He's a low-profiled businessman from one of China's more remote provinces. It is due to him that one fine February day in 2018, we find ourselves in Cambridge, Massachusetts, on the campus of the oldest university in the United States. Aaron Arnold got in touch with us via an intermediary to say he wanted to talk. What about was unclear. Despite early warnings that Harvard University is home to all manner of intelligence operatives and diplomats attempting to win journalists over to their cause, we agreed to a meeting. If we learned one thing in recent years, it's that if a world-class expert like Arnold comes calling, we should at least tend an open ear. You never know, it might lead to a story. Investigators from around the world have been hunting him for years, but he remains a phantom, the former FBI analyst says. Nothing can stop his lethal business. Carl Lee first came to Arnold's attention many years ago when he had just started working at the FBI Counter Proliferation Center. Arnold explains that it isn't easy for countries like Iran and North Korea to come by the materials needed for building missiles and warheads, largely due to sanctions imposed to deter their armament programs. So what they need is a businessman with the requisite experience and the right contacts. Specialists who have earned the trust of scientists and military personnel and who know which officials to bribe and which secure transport routes to use so they won't get caught. Lee is one such specialist. In fact, he's the specialist. The Chinese businessman has been operating on an unprecedented scale, Arnold says. Even with the world's intelligence services and prosecutors on his case, he continues trading. There's an aura of mystery around Carl Lee, Arnold adds. Virtually nobody in the general public would recognise Lee's name, let alone his face. There are very few articles about him, and yet Lee is so high up on the CIA's wanted list that special forces of the kind who killed bin Laden etch his face into their memories the moment their training starts. It was under George W. Bush that the US agencies first came across Lee, Arnold says. Under Obama they started pursuing him, and still the hunt goes on, in vain. They knew that Lee supplied Iran, where he usually holed up in China, and which flights he caught to Iran, as well as whom he met there. But he seemed untouchable. According to Arnold, his name kept coming up in summits between the US and Chinese governments, and yet nothing happened. For years and years, Chinese diplomats listened to complaints from their American counterparts and asked to be kept informed via reports and diplomatic cables, and still Li kept doing what he was doing. One of the big questions Arnold and his fellow investigators were never able to answer was whether Lee worked alone or as a front for a criminal organisation, one of China's intelligence agencies, 
the Chinese authorities or even several governments at once. And what would it mean if he did? Arnold tells us that Lee's nickname is the tailor because he comes up with a bespoke solution for every problem. In practice, these problems tend to be obstacles erected by international agencies to prevent this kind of smuggling. Border controls, satellite surveillance, customs checks. Lee clearly has no peers when it comes to overcoming these hurdles. It seems as if this mysterious gun runner has a guardian angel. Read the book to find out what happens after this.